The Beatrice Kuhn Professorship of Law was established in 1987 by Neil Bloom, a 1962 graduate of the law school who named the chair in memory of his mother. Mr. Bloom is president of JMB Realty Corporation Chicago and a member of the university's board of trustees. Mr. Bloom was unable to attend today, but we thank him for his generous support of this endowed chair. A scholar who has that rare distinction of having influenced multiple academic disciplines with his research, including the fields of law, psychology, and business, teacher extraordinaire, an academic expert who has used his science to impact important issues of public policy, as well as courtroom cases affecting real people. I'm talking, of course, about Jonathan J. Kohler, the worthy recipient of the Beatrice Kuhn Professorship of Law at Northwestern Law School. Jonathan Kohler, the scholar. Jay studies how people assess probability and evaluate evidence. His research represents the best of what the field of psychology of judgment and choice has to offer, insightful, high-quality glimpses into the way people make decisions. He has a keen grip of how people think about statistical evidence, and he operationalizes his understanding into tight, intuitive experiments. Jay's scholarship has probably influenced and been cited by more disciplines, including the fields of law, philosophy, business, accounting, finance, sports, and of course psychology, than any other scholar on our faculty. While Jay's work fits into a number of categories, he might best be described as an empirical Bayesian, a scholar who incorporates Bayes' theorem into the way he tests human decision making. Specifically, Jay assesses how people, judges and jurors especially, use or do not use evidence, particularly statistical evidence, to update their prior beliefs about criminal defendant's guilt or innocence, or some other matter that caused for a decision to be made. Jay takes his use of Bayes' theorem quite seriously. In fact, just last week, he and his wife Molly named their newborn son Theo Bayes Kohler. <laughs> OK, Jay, you can only go so far with this, OK? But I think uh, Theo happens to be up there today, so. Some studies show people discounting base rates and others show people attending closely to them. Jay's empirical work has gone a long way towards identifying when people evaluate evidence in accord with notions of Bayes' theorem and when they do not. Although an understanding of how people evaluate evidence has broad applications, Jay has focused his efforts on a fairly natural application, that of evidence evaluation in the courtroom. In this context, Jay has found that judges and jurors make choices that are both consistent with deductive logic and not consistent with it, and he gives us some sense of what determines the matter. This is important scholarship for courts, given the rising use of DNA evidence, and that courts have few, if any, rules governing how probabilistic evidence is presented in the courtroom, whether it be DNA, fingerprints, footprints, or even bite marks. All of this work, all of his work on how people react to probabilistic evidence has made Jay a leader, or maybe even the leader, in the field of how jurors assess DNA evidence. Jay's set of work on probability and DNA evidence illustrate how a basic understanding of how people think can lead directly to useful applications. And understanding how people evaluate evidence is useful to a full range of human activities, from evidence in the courtroom to how stock traders activities excuse me, how stock traders evaluate research reports. Jay has attended to one aspect of this in DNA evidence, but his theoretical work has laid the foundation for much more. In addition to being published and cited widely for his work on forensics and evidence, Jay has been awarded numerous grants from the National Science Foundation to study this topic, and he was recently awarded a grant from the National Institute of Justice to study jurors' judgments about forensic identification evidence. Yet another important scholarship contribution is Jay's work on the concept of betrayal aversion, which shows the often irrational inclination to avoid choices based on a slim risk of betrayal, such as the tiny chance of causing harm from a generally safer seatbelt or a more beneficial vaccine. He has conducted numerous experiments demonstrating that decision makers have a powerful aversion to people and products that sometimes cause the very harm that they were entrusted to protect against. 
He has shown that people react more negatively to acts of betrayal than to identical bad acts that do not violate a duty or promise to protect. As a result, people are often willing to incur greater risk of the very harm they seek protection from to avoid the mere possibility of betrayal. This work has broad implications for manufacturers of safety equipment and for regulators. This area also offers great potential for understanding decision making and medical malpractice and other tort context. One notable legal scholar in summarizing Jay's scholarship stated that, Jay is not the sort of researcher who believes people are fundamentally stupid and need to be protected, nor is he the type to defend the rationality of human judgment at all costs. His view of the world is more nuanced. People are busy and generally lack expertise in making many of the decisions that they must make in the courtroom and beyond. The tools that they bring to these choices are sometimes inadequate, but, he, but can be sharpened with a little adjustment of the environment in which they function. This view is measured and sensible and avoids much of the silliness of what is sometimes called the great rationality debate within psychology and which has spread in part to law. Jay Kohler, the teacher. Throughout his career, Jay has consistently received teaching awards. At his previous institution, the University of Texas, he was selected as a university distinguished teaching professor. This honor is given to 10 members of the tenured faculty university-wide for teaching excellence. Two comments from some of Jay's former students illustrate his influence as a teacher. One student commented, Dr. Kohler is one of the best professors I've ever had because of how well he can relate to his students. He also finds a way to make the subject material he teaches entertaining as well as informative. Whenever I need advice on something, he is one of the first people I look for. Another student said, Professor Kohler has an infectious enthusiasm for his topic. And though I never thought I'd say this, I have used the material from his class in every job I've had since then. It appears that Jay's commitment to great teaching is now being realized here in the short time that he's been at Northwestern. In addition to getting some of the highest teaching evaluations as a professor of evidence, he has received uh, recently from the Student Bar Association a faculty, a faculty Appreciation Award for his teaching. Finally, Jay has been someone who has influenced popular debates on public policy and law through his contact with the real world. He has routinely been asked to testify in serious criminal cases as to how the judge and jury should think about the statistical evidence and the probability that a lab or some other person in contact with the DNA evidence made an error. To illustrate his reach into the popular debate, I need go no further than to mention that he was a key consultant to O.J. Simpson and the Dream Team in a memorable case from the 20th century. Yes, you're that old. I now talk about the centuries you, uh, you affected. Um, whether he is being interviewed on NPR, quoted in the New York Times, or providing expert testimony for judges and juries in a criminal case on how to interpret forensic statistical evidence, Jay represents the best of Northwestern with his quality and balanced assessments of how to interpret the evidence before us to make the best decisions we can as human beings. I present you Jonathan Kohler, the Beatrice Kuhn Professor of Law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emerson, for that uh, exaggerated and largely untrue introduction. Um, the, uh, the dean and I have a special bond that the dean now knows about. Um, we both have a Rico Suave in our lives. Um, when, I lived <clears throat> when I lived in Austin, Texas, um, I had a barber named Rico Suave. Um, he was also the former boxing champion, or a film, former boxing champion from the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the Dean's Rico Suave is his dog. Um, that's all I'm going to say about the Dean's Rico Suave. I'll come back to my Rico Suave in a moment. Um, but first I should mention that when I was an assistant professor at the University of Texas in the mid, early to mid-1990s, um, part of my research, as Emerson mentioned, focused on the difficulties jurors have understanding the meaning of the statistics that they hear in criminal cases, um, you often involving DNA evidence. Um, I found that people don't have a good sense of how to trade off the very small probabilities that a suspect would innocently match a DNA profile, such as one in a million or one in a billion, 
um, with the much larger probability, say one in 100 or one in 1,000, that the analyst doing the uh, analysis, the DNA analysis, made a crucial error that um, implicated an innocent suspect. Um, so shortly after publishing some of these studies, I got a phone call from, as Emerson mentioned, one of the defense attorneys in the O.J. Simpson case. This was the criminal case. Um, and the attorney said that he'd read a paper of mine and he wanted me to come to Los Angeles to testify about my findings in an admissibility hearing um, in front of Judge Ito. And the defense was hoping to block the uh, prosecution's use of DNA evidence, um, and they were gonna argue that the numbers that the prosecution was gonna present were confusing and misleading. Um, the attorney told me that my testimony would be needed at 9 a.m. this coming Monday, um, and I agreed to testify, and I immediately told everybody I knew to set their VCRs for 9 a.m. Pacific time on Monday morning so they could capture my 15 minutes of fame. I thought that was important to people that I knew. Three days before my national debut, I did what I suspect most of you would have done. I arranged for a haircut. And this is where Rico Suave comes in. I told Rico that this was a big haircut for me, and you know, I was counting on him. And uh, he was, like so many people at that time, he was obsessed with this case, and he was watching hours and hours of court TV. Um, and he just couldn't believe that he knew somebody who was about to appear in the O.J. Simpson case. And at some point during the haircut, um, Rico asked if I could wave to him from the witness stand. <laughs> and you know, naturally, I, I declined, and you know, this, this former Wisconsin boxing champion who was holding a scissor to the back of my neck persisted, um, but I held firm. But then he said, well, maybe there's something else you could do. Maybe you could just give me a wink. <laughs> and I said, I'm not gonna give you a wink. And he said, well, it could be a blink. It could be like a strong blink. And, <laughs> And we spent a lot of time going over how I might do this. And I said, look, Rico, I'm just not going to do this. I'm completely panicked about having to go there in the first place. I'm just not going to wave or wink or blink or anything of the sort. Um, but he got into my head. And as I went home, all I could really think about was not winking when I was on the witness stand. <laughs> and so I went to bed that night. And the next morning, I woke up kind of a winking, blinking, twitching mess. <laughs> and I had to fly out to LA that day. Um, but just before I left for the airport, uh, I got a call from one of uh, the Simpson attorneys and he told me that my testimony was no longer needed. <laughs> the attorneys changed strategies and I was out. Just like that, out. Um, I had mixed emotions, but the most prominent one was relief. Um, since that time, contrary to what Emerson has suggested, I really have not done very much consulting and only occasionally testify in trials. And, you know, this may be because I've realized that my time is better spent doing the behind-the-scenes academic research and the teaching that mean the most to me, uh, or perhaps I don't consult or testify much because very few people have called me since the O.J. Simpson trial. <laughs> Either way, I am absolutely thrilled to be doing my research here at Northwestern Law School. I am thrilled to be teaching the brilliant Northwestern law students. I am honored to be part of this diverse and outstanding faculty. Uh, uh, I thank uh, Emerson Tiller and Dean Rodriguez uh, for their uh, kind comments, and I thank uh, Mr. Neil Bloom for this chair, which, as Emerson mentioned, he established 25 years ago in memory of his mother, Beatrice Kuhn. Um, and speaking of mothers, um, I wish to thank members of my own family who are here today, including my mother, Barbara Kohler, and my father, Ernest Kohler, um, my sister, Cindy, and her husband, Gordon, who flew here all the way for this ceremony, just for this ceremony, from Mill Valley, California. They may also have come here to see the new baby, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I thank my sister Allison and her husband Howard, who are here from the equally distant uh, Gurney, Illinois, taking expressway traffic into account. <laughs> Uh, I thank my Aunt Harriet Kohler, who is here from a building directly across the street from the law school. <laughs> and, and most importantly, I thank my beautiful wife, Molly, my beautiful daughter, Phoebe, and my chubby seven-day-old son, Theo, who gives special meaning to my life on occasions like this and on more ordinary days as well. So thank you.